Come close. Just so. Come here. <laughs> hey, folks. <laughs> Welcome to the Dark Horse <laughs> Podcast, live stream number 149, which I'm told is prime, but it doesn't feel like it should it be. It really doesn't feel prime. Yeah. yeah it's that's that what nine. We're... It's so it's divisible the nine, by three. Yeah. Um, but, and know. 49 divisible by seven. It right. Just, no, it, it just seems, feels unprime. Yes. We are, yeah. we are united and not divided over the divisibility of 149. In any case, I am Dr. Brett Weinstein. This is Dr. Heather Hying. There was a false start to this podcast with a technical difficulty with one of the microphones. And as a result of that, we are going to clip this one. We're starting here brand new, which means that our scintillating discussion of sticker adhesives is <laughs> going to be lost to history. It's an yep. Easter egg for those of you who care enough about Dark Horse to watch live. And so anyway... Um, Indeed. No, we're not going to repeat that here. You missed it. If you missed it, you missed it. That's right. That's and so you will never know. You will forever wonder what what is causing 11% of the misery in the Western world. You won't know. You won't um, know. Nope. But uh, those who watched, no. Yeah, I was going to say next time be on time, but I, we are hardly in a position to say that. No, Apologies for I would the not really, that. really late I starts even all the time. Think that. Here we are in our new permanent, temporary, permanent, temporary, permanent studio. Did it's I get that right? It's permanent, temporary, I believe. It's that, not. That's it's not A B A B A. I thought it was a permanent, temporary, permanent, temporary, permanent. If we're going to be switching to iambic, to, iambic <laughs> pentameter, I, I needed to know that a half an hour ago. I don't. <laughs> You need lead time for iambic pentameter, yes. really. I don't think uh, specifying A, B, A, B, A, whatever is inherent. That, it's so. not inherently either iambic or pentameter no, or pentametric. No, it did seem like the direction you were going. You I were might going be. To constri- you know, look, I, I'm no fan of free verse. I know. But for podcasts, you kind of have to go with it. Well, riffing, yes. Riffing is, is pretty free. Totally. Yes. Yes. Sometimes you get into a rhythm, but uh, anyway, yeah. here we are. You get on a roll, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, I don't know. I didn't get on <laughs> That reminds me of that moment in Flight of the Concords. But uh, anyway, I digress. I guess. What moment in Flight of the Concords? There's a point at which uh, one of the dudes, I forget which one it is, is uh, rapping, and he claims his rhymes are bottomless, and then he's got nothing. <laughs> um, Excellent. He's, he's the hip hop apotamus. Oh, rhymes are yes. Bottomless. Yes. 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 Um, what a weird show. <laughs> Ah, yes, Flight of the Concords, Concords, C-H-O-R-D-S, for those of you who haven't heard of this show. Yeah, it's yeah. a great one. Yeah. Uh, all right, so here we are. Uh, it is uh, Dark Horse Live Stream of 149, here with our technical difficulties and our almost snoring dog, and uh, and there's a lot to talk about. Yes. But first, some some business. Uh, we follow these live streams with a live Q&A. You can ask questions at darkhorsesubmissions.com. If you're watching on YouTube, the chat is live on Odyssey, and uh, very soon after we are done, uh, the as as we've already talked about, the video will be clipped. We'll go, we'll put it on Spotify as well, and we will um, also be on all of the podcast places, so you can listen anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Uh, please join me also every week at Natural Selections, which is where I write uh, weekly on my Substack, naturalselections.substack.com. Uh, this week I did. Uh, something that I talked about on Dark Horse last week, which is that I transcribed a piece of an episode that we did in January of this year. I think it was episode 112. I don't remember anyway. I talk about natural selections, in which we predicted that some among those who were crying for vaccine mandates and uh, being very uh, laughing at laughing at and harming those of us who were resisting the authoritarian and anti-scientific uh, advice and uh, and demands that were coming down from on high public health on high, we predicted that they would soon basically try to disappear their their sins. And uh, indeed, what we saw last week or a week and a half ago at this point uh, was a piece uh, by uh, Emily Oster in the Atlantic asking for amnesty. Uh, so I transcribed uh, for Natural Selections this week a a piece out of our discussion from now almost 10 months ago in which we said this is going to happen and um, we can't I, I actually I, I recommend it I recommend they're going back to the conversation itself or looking at the looking at the transcript because we don't arrive at exactly the same place we don't start at exactly the same place we don't arrive at exactly the same place but um, we do both uh, mightily object to the idea that this should just be passed 
and disappear into history without anyone learning anything and without any, therefore, assurances that it won't happen again and soon and perhaps worse. Yeah, I read the the transcript that you did, and uh, I think it is it's important not only to see that it was predicted and that it is unfolding, but to understand why it was predictable, that there's yeah. a confluence between the interests of those uh you know, members of the private sector who got it wrong, mm -hmm. listened to the wrong authorities, and those who actually uh, perpetrated this monstrosity of policy, um, that they have a shared interest in essentially finding new voices to slap those in power on the wrist, rather than to have a full accounting that says, how the hell did this happen and how can we prevent it from happening again? And so anyway, uh, we call that the middle ground scramble and um, it is it is afoot. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, yeah, I, I recommend people go back and, and look at your, your sub stack on it. Wonderful. Okay, we also have a fantastic new store, as I mentioned uh, last week. And Zach, you can show you can show our newest product here. No worries. I just want to talk about the store a little bit. It is uh, run the, not only the store but also the print shop associated with the store. So the online store and the print shop that's actually producing the merchandise are run by a couple um, right here in the United States. They are amazing, and the product quality is. Um, uh, much higher and consistently higher than it could be when we were working with uh, with with Teespring. Uh, so we encourage you to go there. Any chance you can make that any bigger? Uh, yeah. So this is the newest product. Um, a couple weeks ago, we introduced "Do Not Affirm, Do Not Comply," uh, and this is "Lie to a Tyrant," uh, which was generated. It was inspired by Brett ending a live stream a few weeks back by saying "Lie to a Tyrant," and so. Here we have, that's just really hard to see. Uh, but anyway, the artwork is fabulous. Uh, go take a look and uh, and this is, this is I'm very pleased with this. This is great. And yep. there's a whole lot of other stuff there as well. So that's at darkhorsestore.org. Um, <clears throat> and we are, uh, of course, supported by you. We are grateful for you. We appreciate you subscribing, liking, sharing both our full episodes and uh, any clips that are generated uh, at Dark Horse Podcast Clips on both YouTube and Odyssey. And YouTube is putting ads on our stuff, but they demonetized us fully. So uh, they and only they are making money from the ads that they put on our things. Uh, so if you uh, if you're in a position to and um, and feel like it, we encourage you to join one of our Patreons, where you get access to private monthly Q and A's, which are a lot of fun, intimate conversations with Brett, and also access to the Discord server where you can engage in honest conversations about difficult topics, join a book club, unwind with virtual happy hours and karaoke, young or old, left or right, there's a spot for you at the campfire. And of course we have sponsors. So the ads that we're about to read, which will be introduced with a sound and, um, and what's the opposite of introduced? Uh, outroduced? Outroduced would be the modern that trailed by... Yeah, finished by... Anyway. Yes. There's a little sound at the beginning and the end of the ads, and whenever we are reading ads, for those of you watching, there's a green pyramid around the screen. So that's where you know when we are actually reading sponsored content. Nothing else in our show ever is. Um, that said, we choose our sponsors very, very carefully, and we don't read ads for products or services that we don't actually vouch for. So uh, with that said, let us proceed with the three ads for today. And you are first. All right. We are thrilled to have Western Razor Company sponsoring Dark Horse. And I particular, in particular, am thrilled. Uh, I want to tell you why. My grandfather, Harry, was a chemist. He worked on vinyl for long playing records at RCA. He worked on dental polymers. And he worked at Schick Safety Razor Company. That's what he called it. Normal people just call it Schick, at least now. <laughs> but in any case, when I uh, was young and I would visit him, I would look at the razor prototypes that he had kept. And these safety razors weren't at all like modern razors. They were hefty, durable, serious objects built to last. So these are like from the 40s or 50s? Wow. Boy, yeah. I don't remember exactly. You visited him in the 70s, I, I and they were at that point historical. I think it would have been the 50s, but it could have been, okay. could have been earlier. Mm -hmm. um, years later, when I began shaving, I forgot all about those old razors. The world was by then full of colorful, up-to-date options with pivoting heads, lubricating strips, and multiple blades. Isn't progress grand? Decades later, I've come full circle. It's true that modern razors are better. Better at getting you to spend a lot more than necessary on shaving. Pivoting heads? That's a gimmick. You are supposed to adjust the angle of the razor for the contours of your face, not have the razor follow the path of least resistance. Wait, but doesn't that take skill? 
Uh, yes, you do have to learn a little Doesn't bit. Doesn't that how take to attention? Shave. Shouldn't you be able to not pay any attention when you have a blade near your neck? Oh, uh, shaving without paying attention is not a winning strategy. Um, all right, let's talk about lubrication strips. <laughs> Am I getting in the way? No, no, it's it's, okay, it's all to the good. good. Lubrication strips, they work at first, but they exhaust themselves quickly, leading you to toss a razor that still has life left in the blades. And speaking of blades, how many do you really need? The fact is that multiple blades packed tightly together is just another scam. That arrangement is guaranteed to clog with hair and soap, so you'll toss it in the garbage and reach for another. Also seems more likely that one of them is going to need a little, a little nick in it and therefore be more likely to cut you. You can just look at the thing. You know, yeah. there's a principle in aviation. Uh, if it doesn't look right, it won't fly right. Mm. And you can look at these multi-blade monstrosities and you just know that that's not an elegant solution to any known problem. <laughs> so I need to try these. Yes, you do. Yeah. If you want a close shave, then what you need is a no-nonsense shaving instrument. A safety razor from Western Razor Company looks like a tool, it feels like a tool, and it functions like a tool because that's what it is. No plastic, no gimmicks, no hidden costs, no subscriptions. You pay up front for a top quality handle made entirely here in the U.S. It comes with five double-sided blades, and when you need more top quality blades, double-sided razor blades are available for less than 20 cents a piece. Point of order. That's awesome. It comes with five double-sided blades, but you only use one at a time. You use one side at a time, unless okay. two of you are going so to shave get, so very it, close so together. So it comes with 10, t ten blade ten surfaces. Sides. Yes, okay. it does. But these things are so it's beautifully made, very inexp inexpensive uh, mm -hmm. refills for these things. All right, so what do you do? You go to westernrazor.com slash darkhorse and use the promo code darkhorse to support the podcast and get 10% off your order and take a stand against the propaganda stranglehold of big shaving. Again, that's westernrazor.com slash darkhorse and use the promo code darkhorse at checkout. Awesome. All right, our second ad sponsor today is Element. That's L-M-N-T. Element is an electrolyte drink mix that has everything you need and nothing you don't. It's got a lot of salt, a thousand milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 of magnesium. But it has no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, and no fillers. Electrolytes facilitate hundreds of functions in the body, including the conduction of nerve impulses, hormonal regulation, and nutrient absorption. Element's electrolytes can help prevent and eliminate headaches, muscle cramps, and sleeplessness. We've now heard from several friends about how much they like Element for themselves or in some cases for the physically hardworking men in their lives. They drink it every day and feel better doing so. When you sweat, the primary electrolyte lost is sodium. Athletes can lose up to 7 grams per day. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs, not just athletes, and is perfectly suited to folks following a keto, low-carb, or paleo diet. Element is, as I said, not just for athletes. Anyone being active may find that they benefit from Element. Even drinking a few glasses of wine can leave you depleted, and Element can help. If you're feeling depleted or dehydrated, drink water and consider Element as well. Right now, Element is offering our listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single-serving packets, free with any Element order. This is a great way to try all eight flavors or share Element with a salty friend. And I will say, some of the flavors, not to my liking, some of them are quite good. So you probably want to try them and see which ones work for you and which ones you can pawn off on your salty friends. Get yours at drinkelement.com slash darkhorse. This deal is only available through our link. You must go to drinklmnt.com slash darkhorse to get your free eight samples and figure out which ones you love. Element offers no questions asked refunds. Try it totally risk-free. If you don't like it, share it with, again, that salty friend of yours, and they will give you your money back, not the salty friend. Element will give you your money back if you don't like it. No questions asked. You have nothing to lose. Your salty and well-heeled friends might give you your money back. Just, <laughs> yes. just to get rid of you. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay, our final sponsor this week is Relief Band, a product that can help with nausea. In ancient times, nausea was a signal that something was off, and that signal was useful. Nausea was telling you that you had eaten something you shouldn't have or were near something emanating a bad smell, itself a signal that you should not go near it. In modernity, we still need to track our bodily sensitivities. We should not always choose to erase discomfort like nausea when we feel it. But some aspects of modernity create nausea that does no good at all. Travel sickness, for instance, can be agonizing and relief would be lovely. Enter Relief Band. Relief Band is an anti-nausea wristband that has been clinically proven to relieve and prevent nausea associated with motion sickness, anxiety, migraines, chemotherapy, and more. Relief Band is 100% drug-free and can be used for as long as you need it. 
Developed over 20 years ago, it was the only over-the-counter wearable device that has been used in hospitals and oncology clinics to treat nausea and vomiting, and there are zero side effects. And now there's Relief Band Sport, which is waterproof, features interchangeable bands, and has extended battery life. We asked a friend to try it out, since we are lucky enough to rarely experience nausea ourselves. Here is her testimonial. I used to have nausea on a near, da near daily basis from both anxiety and the need to take regular medication. Relief Band relieves my nausea in less than three minutes without the side effects I was experiencing from anti-nausea medication. It has entirely changed my life for the better. So if you've got nausea from anxiety or car or seasickness or something else that you cannot otherwise disable, consider Relief Band. Relief Band makes a great gift for any time of year. Right now, they've got an exclusive offer just for Dark Horse listeners. Go to reliefband.com and use promo code DARKHORSE to receive 20% off plus free shipping and a no-questions-asked 30-day money-back guarantee. That's reliefband.com, and use our promo code DARKHORSE for 20% off plus free shipping. All right. All right. Here we are. Um, my computer has gone to sleep. I hope you have not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at the point that you bore your computer into sleep. Oh, man, Maybe I've been, been there more than once. you've been droning on too long. Yep. It's possible. Okay. Um, can we start by talking about certainty? I think so. Excellent. I was in Portland this week. I went back to the city that we called home for four years, uh, in part to see some of the amazing uh, medical providers that I have formed relationships with down, with down there, and yes, um, they do exist. Uh, and in part, the timing was uh, to be there for the election, to see to see what it felt like and to see if anything blew up. <laughs> um, and the, I, I, I think we'll talk a bit about a lot of these things, and I think my substack this next week is going to be talking a bit about what I saw in Portland. Um, I, don't, I don't have it in a soundbite or even a series of soundbites yet. There's just, there's a lot to say about what that city with so much potential is and has and what it's doing. Uh, but one of the things that I did while I was there was I met with um, just a wonderful woman uh, who I'm not gonna name her, I, I failed to ask if I could. Um, but I know she watches Dark Horse. And she is finding herself angry and in talking angry that so many among her circle of oldest friends and some among her family are responding to her like she's the problem and for for not vaccinating her children for not wearing a mask when she's outside for not trusting the public health officials that we know have been lying to us now for a long time and not trusting the next thing that comes out of their mouths. For this, she is being told that she is wrong. And I began to say, yeah, they judge us, don't they? And I realized in this, this conversation I had with her, no, we're all judging each other now. We are all judging each other. We are. We seem to be, so many of us, increasingly certain of our positions. And I then, I also saw a piece of theater um, in Portland that put this into very sharp relief, uh, in which a person who has simply adopted, it was a, it was a one woman show, a person who has simply adopted all of the narratives from the mainstream and the public health apparatus as, as the truth, as the only truth, as the forever truth, has said, I, I was watching her certainty and thought, well, okay, how is her certainty? How are the people in our lives who are angry with us for making these decisions that we feel more and more certain were the right ones, how is their certainty different from our certainty? And one of the things I arrived at was, we didn't start out certain. We started out skeptical and hesitant and employing the precautionary principle with things like, where's this virus from? What might it do? How's it gonna proceed? Let's use the wisdom that we do have as for instance, evolutionary biologists, as bat biologists, as people with a history of thinking about granting agencies. 
and figure out what we think might be true and figure out what the predictions of those ideas would be. And let's see what happens. And when, for instance, the COVID vaccines were beginning to be rolled out and we were told they're safe, they're 100% safe. There are a lot of us who said, you just lied to us. Not because we didn't, not because we knew that they weren't 100% safe, because we didn't, but because we knew that they couldn't know. No, no, you got to be careful about that. They could not be 100% safe if they didn't know whether or not they did harm. They could have been 100% harmless, but the safety comes from knowing that they do no harm. Uh, maybe this is important. It doesn't strike me as important at the moment, um, that, that distinction. Um, I, and I think that's going to muddle the issue here because th this is a very important issue. And I, I, I think you're going to have to let me not go down that semantic road for the moment. And you can, you can do the Fair clarification enough. that you think you need to afterwards. Our objections, not just us, but so many people, so many people's objections, people with scientific training, people without scientific training, people in all lines of work, at the point that a new medical treatment is brought to market, and we are told they're 100% safe, what we know for sure is you can't know that. There hasn't been time. We are uncertain. We were at that point uncertain. We, in fact, figured, we assumed we're going to wait as long as possible, and then we'll, we'll get them because we're going to, we will get them probably, right? Mm -hmm. And then weeks passed and months passed, and more and more evidence did become public. And it became clear, clearer and clearer that actually not safe, not effective. By contrast, the people who were certain in the other direction started out that way. They were told by people who were not telling them the truth, these are safe and effective. And they said, ah, oh, they're safe and effective. And anyone who says differently is a conspiracy theorist, an anti-vaxxer or whatever. And so the prediction I want to make which is maybe, maybe prediction isn't even exactly the right word here, but the prediction I want to make is that even though I, at this point, have a high degree of certainty that, for instance, the COVID vaccines are neither safe nor effective, I did not start out that way. And I think that the, of the, if, if you take the, the two camps, such as it is, over in COVID vaccine territory, uh, the what is wrong with you people? Why are you putting us all in harm's way? Take the damn vaccine crowd. And the absolutely not, I'm not going to do it. And what are you doing to your children crowd? At the moment, the people in these crowds seem to have similar levels of certainty with opposite valences. But the prediction is that the people over, there are some people over in the I'm not getting near your damn vaccine crowd who started out that way. And they were also being non-scientific in their approach. Right? But there, my prediction is that there are more people over in the I'm not taking that treatment crowd who started out uncertain and skeptical and hesitant and using the precautionary principle and using science. And as more and more evidence came in, developed a higher degree of certainty because that's what science does for you. And that by contrast, the people over here who started out certain that, they, that this was going to be the thing that ended the pandemic have changed in no way in their certainty, even as evidence has arrived in abundance to the contrary, that their, their degree of certainty has not changed. And when you see anyone with a position whose degree of certainty has not changed, you know they are not thinking logically, you know they are not thinking scientifically, and you know that for all of their talk about nuance and being following the science and all of that, they are wrong. Whether or not they're deceiving themselves or just deceiving you, I don't know. It doesn't matter, but they are wrong. All right, several things to say about this. One, I want to point out that there are two instances in which I know myself to have visibly changed my position in a way that you could even go back and check. In, in this pandemic. In, this, in, the, in it, the context of the pandemic. Yeah. One of them is at the very start. Mm. The following thing can be found on Twitter. You and I, as we've talked about before, did not know about the novel coronavirus until we emerged from finishing the first draft of our book where we were deep in the Amazon, where we had no connectivity, unaware that there was a news story brewing. Mm -hmm. As we emerged to the first place that your phone connects, a military checkpoint. End of January 2020. Yep. We emerged to news. We were in Ecuador. We emerged to news that there was this novel coronavirus, which we started to wrap our minds around. And oddly, 
that the first case had just arrived in Ecuador. So we were getting information on our phone in mm -hmm. Spanish, new case, novel coronavirus from China, yep. etc. cetera. Um, as I looked into it, story was, this was a, a bat virus that had jumped to humans. I knew something about the family of bats in question because I had been a bat researcher. And I tweeted something that said, I haven't looked very deeply into this story, but so far it seems to check out, right? Mm -hmm. I know these animals, I know something about these viruses circulating in these animals. It looks right to me. And I got back a tweet from an account that uh, I knew only online. And the account said something like, yeah, right, it's a coincidence that this happened in, you know, uh, in a city that had uh, a, a level four, um, biosafety level four lab studying these exact viruses. And I looked at that and I thought, what don't I know? What the hell? That is a weird and coincidence. That thought, that thought, what don't I know? Anyone who doesn't ask themselves that question on the regular is also not trustworthy. Right. Thing is, so I retracted my claim that this story made sense. I didn't yet know what made sense, but I yeah. knew at that point that there was something here that I had not factored into my calculation. So whatever I had said publicly didn't make any sense. Yes. And, you know, it could have been that it was, uh, that the story did check out and that the existence of the laboratory in Wuhan was a coincidence, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, which I guess I would have figured out over time. But the point is, I, I believe the two tweets are separated just by accident, by exactly an hour, right? That the whole thing, the recognition that I had said something that I now knew was not grounded because it missed the whole set of facts that were potentially relevant, that's captured in the space of exactly one hour in that case. And it could have been an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year. It could have been anything. And it could have been anything, but the point is you went back and you said, ah, my level of certainty was too high, and as it turns out, the wrong valence. Right. Right. And so, anyway, th this is, I mean, and you know, it makes, I remember my emotional state that I like saying, hey, I said something scientifically about something in my own discipline, and now I've, you know, an hour later, I've got to take it back. Do I like that? No, but it's far better, far better than sticking with a wrong idea because it would be embarrassing to admit that it was wrong. Be, you know, it well, there's a sunk costs fallacy there too, right? That you did not succumb to, but that most people do. Well, I've already done the thing. I've already like this. Is it sunk? Maybe it's not. Maybe that's not quite the right fallacy. There's a like, I don't. There's a good uh, money after bad. It's good money after bad. Okay. That's, that's it. So I don't, oh, this is going to be bad. For, this is going to feel really uncomfortable. The longer you wait, the worse it gets guys. Well, you know, and uh, I think the thing that is important not to have done, right? Mm -hmm. One could do the calculation and say, well, okay, I've just learned something I didn't know. It changes my private certainty about how sensible the story that I've heard is. Mm -hmm. But it's possible that the story that I believe is correct is still going to turn out to be correct. So if I can just... The zoonotic origin. Yeah, if yeah. I can just put off making a correction, then it's possible the problem solves itself, right? That's yeah. not, that is a way to get yourself in trouble, which is mm -hmm. why I didn't do that, right? The right thing to do is to say, actually, mm -hmm. as of now, I'm aware that even if the natural origin story turns out to be right, that it has to overcome a threshold that I didn't even realize existed because I didn't know that that lab was there. <sighs> That's just so beautiful. That like that right there, that is an encapsulation of both what you do and what all scientists should do, and what everyone should do in communicating with the world, having made a statement, and having learned that there's more to the thing that you pronounced upon with such certainty. Be like brats, like do that. Well, you'll also, you'll, be, you'll just be happier, right? Because the fact is, the relief that you experience for having gotten yourself back to ground you're comfortable with, right? The point is, you're, you're actually taking a risk saying, yeah, I've looked at this paper, seems to add up, thing emerged from bats, you know, in some normal way, right? And then it's like, oh goodness, what, what didn't I know, right? Yeah. There's a fact I didn't have. And then the point is, that the point you say publicly, uh, actually, this fact potentially looks important, I need to know more about it, then it's not haunting you. It's not lurking, waiting to leap out, you know, you're not 
you know, constantly keeping track of how much danger this thing you said is leaving you in. So anyway, just even just from the point of view of your own sanity. It's an honest accounting. It's an honest accounting that means that in the present, you don't have to worry about saying too much or something like and that. And that's not to say, so I mean, I think a, a different approach, the approach that I have tended to take is I don't like, and so, you know, until relatively recently, this is a hundred percent, like I, I just don't make pronouncements out into the world until I've actually, you know, I'm, I'm really prepared to do it because I don't want to have to keep track of all of the things that I've said that I then would do have to actually go and, and correct when, you know, when, when I'm wrong. And obviously podcasting changes that dynamic quite a lot, but I was thinking specifically of social media. Mm -hmm. Like I actually, I, there is just, there is such a joy and like a human potential in sitting in uncertainty and being like, oh, this thing is happening. I don't know what it means. I don't know what the significance is. I don't know where it came from. I don't know what it's going to do. Hmm. And yet, we, in the following two months, we're having these conversations around our dinner table every day. And we're like, you know, I think actually these conversations that we're having are worth sharing. And that was actually what began the live streams. Yep. I began to say to you as you know, our boys' schools were being shut down. It's like, we actually have things to share. And we weren't right about everything early on at all, by any means. Right. But we were having conversations by which we were, tr we were demonstrating how you might figure out what is true. That, and that's the thing. is It's not like, were you right? It's like, do you have a process for becoming right? The process yes. for becoming right involves the uncertainty. It involves saying things that turn out to be wrong, discovering that they are wrong, being honest with yourself and others about it. That's, that's the process. And, you know, science formalizes a piece of this. Right. But um, nonetheless, it's, it's obviously the right thing to do. Now, if, if, if I think back, I remember exactly where we were during this one hour uh, wobble between perspectives here. Hmm. And I remember, I think, my thought process. Why did I weigh in on a story that was so new, right? Why not just hold off and see? And I believe that my thought process was, how many bat biologists does the world know, right? Not that many. Right. I studied under actually one who became quite famous. She now tragically died very early in the field. Elizabeth Calco, who, uh, you know, you, you have probably heard that Zhi Zheng Li was called the Bat Woman um, because she studied bats in China. Well, no, the real Bat Woman was Elizabeth Calco, and she was a force to be reckoned with. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, the point is, the world does not know very many bat biologists. I happen to be a bat biologist with right. hundreds of thousands of Twitter followers, and I felt an obligation to say something precisely because I didn't want conspiracy uh uh, undisciplined conspiracy thoughts to emerge from this. People who showed up certain on the other side without any evidence. Right. Right. Certainty at the beginning of anything like this is is a tell. Yeah. You're not thinking carefully. Are you trying to sell me something? Are you just confused? At some level, it doesn't matter. You're not thinking carefully. Right. So what I said was effectively... You know, this isn't my story. I don't have a dog in this fight, but I do know the bats, right? I know that these viruses circulate amongst them. The story I see written here makes sense to me, mm. right? And that basically says, look, on a first pass, this is a plausible story. It wasn't a plausible story, it turns out, right? And the process of discovery that led there, um, you know, does involve a willingness to be uncertain, including in the first, you know, hour after you've said what you thought was a... I mean, I didn't say anything... Yep. I didn't say the story is true. Yeah, so I said. I think it checks out. It, che it looks checks out. superficially looks right. Mm -hmm. um, the other place where uh, my wrong initial perspective is absolutely captured is masks, um, mm. of which, as you know, I was. We talked a lot about masks. We talked on. a lot about masks. I was very early on um, using masks and advocating for them. I, you made me so grumpy. <laughs> you, you, I did not want to go into stores masked early on, and you're like, it's the thing. And I, I, I came around, and then we both came around the other way. Yep. But and you know, I look, I, you know, I had a model in my head, and I remember I talked about it. I showed it uh, on Dark Horse, mm -hmm. in which the idea was, well, how much I can use my camera to tell me how much light right. is blocked by a bandana, and it's a fair amount. 
And um, that, to me, suggested the likelihood that particles would be blocked. And you can say, well, particles are too tiny, they go through the holes. Apparently they do. But photons are also very tiny. What photons don't do is, you know, there's no flow pattern around a fiber, right? The photon hits the fiber or it doesn't. It doesn't, you know, steer around it. Whereas air flowing over probably brings the particles through the mask, which is probably why they don't work very well. Yep. Um, (coughs) Excuse me. But the following thing also occurs to me in hearing uh, your description here, which is that we had this recent, you know, you say we, we are all judging each other. And I think this is this is true. I think we and are. I know that point. when yeah. I see people wearing masks, I have a thought that I can't stop. Mm-hmm. Especially when I see them wearing masks outside. All right? It's like, okay, how? What what model is running around in your head? You know, years into this, that you still think it makes sense for you to mask yourself outdoors. But I'm going to say here something to you that you often say to me while I'm trying to figure out what is going on in their heads. And you say that it's not like that. Yeah. Like uh, very often, and I, I assume that in some cases it is a model, and it's just a bad model. But very often, it's not a model. And this is this is yeah. to my point about they arrived at the certainty upon being told a thing, and it doesn't get updated. It's not a model. It's not a complex living thing. It's a conclusion. End of story. Done. Right now, this is exactly this is exactly where I'm headed. Is mm-hmm. that you and I had the following uh, episode in our in our own life a minor thing but you and i uh, had an appointment with somebody and i can't remember which one of us had come down with a slight respiratory Mm -hmm. something you know a little cold that under ordinary pre-covid circumstances would not be worth even mentioning it just would be like oh that's annoying Mm -hmm. um but we were going to meet with this person, and in light of COVID... For the uh, first time. This wasn't someone we knew before, right? Yep. yep. I felt it was necessary to warn her and to yep. give her the option to cancel the meeting in case this was COVID, right? And she suggested, quite rightly, how about you wear a mask? And I said, how about we don't wear masks and we meet outside, and then when we go inside to look at the samples or whatever it was that we needed to see, that then we will put on a mask. But then... Two, in fact. We didn't share masks. No, we had two entirely different masks. Um, (laughs) But I remember having the weird thought, like, I do not want the cost of being seen to wear a mask, which implies either a simplistic and wrong model of COVID or... Um, no model at all, as you point out, is likely going on with many of these people. And so it was like, actually, the fact that I don't wear a mask, I certainly don't wear a mask outdoors, but in this case, I was going to put on a mask, right? Now that becomes complex. It's actually evidence. That pattern, if you saw, you know, mm-hmm. hour after hour of not wearing a mask and then, you know, slight respiratory something, and because I'm the person who might be spreading whatever it is, wearing a mask makes more sense. Um, you know, that's evidence of a nuanced model. It's not evidence of the absence of a model, but because masks are something that we now judge each other for because of the way that they have been politicized, um, it was it was a tough calculation that shouldn't have been. Yeah. The right thing to do was to say, look, there's very little harm in it in this case. It's not I'm not committing to wear a mask, you know, in general. It just it happens as a as a courtesy, it made sense. Yeah. Um Last thing I wanted to say from your initial intro here is I think the failure you're talking about is extremely um, clear and consequential with respect to the doctors. Mm. And I suspect that we can learn something about how civilization goes crazy, that your point about certainty, where are the doctors now, right? I don't think you could be a working cardiologist or pathologist or oncologist uh, or coroner and not be aware of the huge harm that we inflicted on ourselves. I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about vaccine adverse events. 
Um, I don't think you could be unaware. And so where is the chorus of these doctors who got it wrong initially and have now realized that and are standing up and saying, you know, it's throughout my cardiology ward. It's, you can't miss it, right? Where are those doctors? Well, there are a couple, but it's not a chorus of them. Why not? And most among the, you know, it's more than a handful, but relative to the core of doctors, it's a handful. It's a tiny, it's a tiny fraction of doctors. Most of them don't have wards anymore. Right, they've been relieved of duty. Oh, that's not who I'm talking about. You're right. That's a tiny number. The dissidents yeah. who came out, who initially said, "Hey, wait a second. What I'm seeing, it doesn't add up. What the claims don't add up. I'm seeing stuff that's not being discussed. There's a system that catches these adverse events. We're not monitoring it." Those doctors stood up, and it was a handful, and they largely and are continuing to lose their positions, their editorships, etc. Yep. Um, I'm talking about doctors who presumably did what they thought was right at the beginning, said what they thought was true at the beginning, now have incontrovertible evidence in front of them and are not standing up now. That's the thing. And there are a couple there who have. Couple, right? There are a couple. Um, some of them have gone halfway, which confuses me. Once you've seen what the what's system... What's the halfway? What's, what's a halfway position? Oh, a halfway position is, uh, yes, these adverse events are very serious, but there is no uh, early treatment option you know, there, there are no repurposed drugs that are worth consideration. So right? the vaccines are still the right choice or? Uh, in some cases, in some cases you yeah. get a partial, like, you know, for many people, they don't make sense, but, which I don't think is true yeah. anymore. Well, and I mean, most, most scientific articles about anything having to do with, uh, with vaccine adverse events still have to start. I mean, it's, you could just see the like guillotine over these guys, over right. the researchers' heads. Like you, you were told by the editor of the journal that you were not able to, pu- you were not going to be allowed to publish any results that in any way show adverse events unless you basically bracket your article with, yeah, but they're awesome. Still, it's the best way to avoid COVID. Yep. And I mean, I think actually BMJ, uh, British Medical Journal, is a very interesting exception that's emerging. The editor of BMJ turns out to be, I think, the reason that we've seen so many interesting op-eds and some research being published there and only there among the major journals. Right. And which tells you something. The the arbitrariness of you have some journal in which author after author is saying the same thing. And the point is, well, you know, under a different editor, but that journal have a radically different perspective, even with the same pool of readership and researchers who use that journal. Editors are powerful, not just, you know, it's not just for literature, right? It's, this is the scientific, there's a reason they call it the scientific literature, because there is someone who is effectively not just, it's not, I don't know if I want to go here, but the concept of midwife gets applied in a lot of places where it has no place. Yeah. And it's, you know, like, how could you object to midwife? It's like, no, actually, sometimes what you're doing is helping create. And midwives don't help create the baby. They help ensure uh, that a baby ends up in the world that was inside a a mother's body and is safe in the world. But the midwife did not help create the baby. And so editors are doing more than midwifing. Oh, yeah. By a lot. And, uh, And I think especially in the scientific realm, those who aren't in science have this very strange cartoonish version of how it is that we come to know what we come to know. And that's part of why you can get things like hashtag follow the science. People are like, oh, okay, I'll follow the science. I guess so. I, that was handed down by science God. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's exactly that kind of cartoonish vision. So yes, if the editor of a journal changes, can the, can the journal change its direction? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. you know, and we've seen, you know, what is the Atlantic today? <sighs> right. It's not a scientific journal under any circumstances, but the point is that that used to be an important publication in which things were hashed out, and now it's effectively uh, a highly politicized rag that, you know, still has high production values, and so people still take it seriously. Um, But uh, what I wanted to get at with the doctors is I think the most brilliant and diabolical move of the public health authorities involved getting the doctors to very publicly speak as one at the very beginning of the uh, vaccine rollout. In other words, the way doctoring is supposed to work, information accumulates clinically, right? Doctors see patients. They, if they're any good, they cannot help but notice patterns. And by getting the doctors on the record effectively challenging any 
claim that there was a pattern of adverse events before that pattern would have come through their office, right? By getting the doctors to do that, somehow it made it very hard for those doctors to reverse course. And part of the, part of the way that was done was by giving it to the doctors first. Was by giving it to the doctors and all the other healthcare professionals first. And this was, you know, I had, I had one doctor who did end up taking and being glad that he took the vaccine. But early on, he was like, what are they doing? Why, like, we can't know. Why, why, why would you put the entire healthcare force, workforce, at risk with a new experimental treatment first? And, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that one of the side effects, perhaps intentional, at least by some, was exactly this. Now that it's all of you who've taken it, and it's your job to make sure that everyone else takes it, you got some complaints or what? Because you, you're already dosed up. Yeah, which is not true. And actually, there's a... Uh, That's an, not true. Uh, that you're already dosed up. This is a... I think that this is a... a intuitive and wrong perspective that has lots of people failing to realize where they are in this program. In other words, there is a dose-dependent relationship. We can see it to some extent already in the evidence, in the data. There's a dose-dependent relationship between um, these, especially the mRNA vaccines and the hazard, and therefore, the, the more you have, the more the greater your risk. Absolutely, yeah. and this this works in. But still, the difference between zero and one is um, rather large. Right, and we can see that some sort of model is where the fact that so few people are taking the boosters. Yeah tells us that lots of people have updated something in their model, whether they've become agnostic about the whole thing and they're in their minds procrastinating and, you know, they just haven't gotten it yet or whatever they're doing. Something is protecting them from getting further doses, even though they haven't stated, you know what, I used to think X and now I don't because. And that's the thing we're waiting for, right? Like it's, it's, it's those sorts of Admission makes it sound too onerous, right? But honesty, be honest with yourself and then share that honesty at least with the people whom you shamed and debilitated. At least share your, your newfound honesty with those uh, for whom your being wrong had a direct negative effect. And you, you know, I, you won't know till you do it. If it's not something that you're used to doing, you won't know till you do it. But you will feel so much better, yeah. right? It's yeah. not easy to say, hey, I really screwed this up. I thought I had it right, but it's really not easy to say. But you will just viscerally feel a huge weight off your shoulders in doing it. And by and large, you know, the game theory says it's all about the future, always. It can never be about anything else. And so the point is when you say to somebody, even somebody who, even if you've been terrible to somebody because you were absolutely sure that they had fallen down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole, whatever that means, right? You may have been terrible to somebody. And if you say, look, I screwed it up. Here's how, but I understand that I did. I feel bad about it. I won't do it again, right? If you say that to somebody, it is not in their interest to say, well, I don't accept your apology. You know, there's nothing you can do to mend this. In general, especially if you have a relationship that has content that goes beyond whatever took place over COVID, people will forgive you, people will be decent to you, and you will just simply not have to live with that fear of, you know, what happens if it emerges. Well, so the idea of people will be decent to you. Those of us who have been, you know, vilified and, you know, we have been quite lucky. We haven't lost people or jobs or, you know, been told to stand outside on Christmas and, and such, as many people have. Uh, those of us on that side of the things are not the ones who aren't being decent, right? Um, but one thing that I hear in what you're saying that I, that I hope is true, but I'm not sure it is, is the kind of heartfelt, I looked inside of myself, I'm seeing the new evidence, and I, I behaved badly, and I was wrong. That 
hopefully can help rebuild trust. But one of the things that has frayed and decayed, and in some cases it's irreparable, is trust between people. And so, again, um, from conversations I had this last week, what I'm hearing from people who have not been apologized to, who have lost relationships, who have lost livelihoods, all of this. But one thing I'm hearing from them is, I don't know, I don't know if I want the relationships back because I won't ever trust them again. And it's not about, it's not about like, I won't trust them because they hurt me, but specifically the thing that was said, and I heard this on more than one occasion was, I gave them what I knew about what the evidence was and they still vaccinated their children. I don't trust them. I will never trust them with my children again. And like, what, what do you do? Well, I don't know what you do. No, uh, I'm afraid we all do and it's built in. The, the, the real thing hinges on the distinction between a pro forma or hedging apology and a real one. And the reason that it hinges on that is not some touchy-feely thing. A real apology in which the person has done the accounting of their own wrongdoing is the insurance that makes them safe to deal with going forward. Perfectly safe? No. But none of us are perfectly safe. So what? there's a, there's a, there's a principle, right? At the point that a company has had a major scandal, what was it? I'm, I'm not going to mention the brand because I'm not 100% certain of it. I've forgotten. But there was a tire company that had covered up the fact that there were blowouts that had killed a number of people, yep. right? Yep, yep. Um, the point is, in the aftermath of that scandal, there's actually a degree of safety in buying those tires. Because of all companies, that company cannot afford to have the pattern continue. Yep. And so you would expect extra vigilance. In fact, you would expect that that company might be willing to take a loss on each tire in order to ensure that it was clear that this pattern had gone away. The extra scrutiny from the public because of past wrongs will will make for extra vigilance on the part of the company. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is, and in my personal policy, which I have, I have said before, is um, a complete accounting of what you did wrong, if it really is complete, is sufficient. Now, there are people here who I believe committed knowing wrongs, who can't apologize and never will because to do so would be effectively to confess to crimes. I, I think you're talking at a different level, though. This is this is funny, though, because you know, having just spent time with that transcript from almost 10 months ago, I feel like we're having that conversation again at some mm. level. And um, the, the, the issue is not so much did they see that it, like, even someone who says, oh, wow, oh, I see now I shouldn't have had my children vaccinated with these vaccines, with these ones. Uh, I won't do that again. Even that leaves open the reality. Like, it doesn't change the reality that you were the sort of person. And, you know, the, the one I was talking to, this one particular conversation, she invoked my, my mama bear's piece on <clears throat> Substack. She said, she said to me, you, my once dear friend, are the sort of person who gave up being a mama bear and trusted someone who'd already lied to you and let them have your children. I can't trust you with my children ever again if you do that. I don't care what kind of apology you make. I don't care if you know that you were wrong. The fact is, there's something in your head. There's something in your head that allowed you to sacrifice your children and no apologies changes that. Look, I, I get it. On the other hand, a full apology would involve the recognition, which is very hard to reach, that you put your own children in danger because you trusted something that you knew you should have known better than to trust. Mm -hmm. Right? So the point is, if somebody said that to you, like, I can't believe that I allowed my children to be vaccinated in this way when, you know, I was being told, hey, even if these vaccines work, 
the risk goes up the younger you are and the risk of COVID is spectacularly low, right? right? If somebody says, hey, I now get that that message was available to me at the time and I allowed myself to be blinded and it had a, it placed it, my kids in danger, right? If somebody said that, then the point is, how likely is it that somebody who has had to wrestle with the terrible knowledge that they put their own children in danger uh, is going to blindly do that again? And if they did start to blindly do that again, and you said, hey, do you remember that time that you took this? I, but I, I feel like you often say to me, no, their minds aren't like that, mm-hmm. right? And I think you know, the 15 years that we spent really teaching college students, like actually really getting to know 25, 50, 75 students really well over the course of a quarter or two or a full academic year or more, but gave us both the sense of like almost everyone's reachable. Almost everyone's alive in there and um, has the, is, is waiting, if they haven't already discovered it, um, to be sparked into creativity and productivity and invention and discovery and exploration and so many interesting things. It was the very rare student, even at this really non-elite college, who wasn't couldn't couldn't be inspired into doing some interesting work, and yet, and yet we see at like the population level where we don't you know we don't know any of these people we don't have access to them and their individual minds on you know a daily basis for weeks on end or months or even years that people are making decisions not based on but why do you think that okay tell me okay let me give you why you shouldn't be thinking that way or why you think I shouldn't be thinking this way without access to them at that level, it looks like it's not a model. It's just a conclusion. No, no. Look, I think you're mixing two things. A, I disagree with you that almost everybody is reachable. I think almost everybody starts out reachable. But but in college classrooms, people were young enough that it felt like... A, they were young enough. B, because your and my classes were so oversubscribed, and they tended to be oversubscribed because students who had gotten a lot out of it told other students okay. who would get a lot so out of it. So the college wasn't selective, but our classes were. Our classes were selective. Okay. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I do believe we are all born in a condition where we can, unless you're, unless you're okay. broken, you... Yep. You can be reached early, but then you lose that capacity. Yep. Um, but my and there's no, there's not a boundary, but it's it it's a slope, right? Yep. And so my point is not, hey, everybody who did wrong here can apologize, and we can be back to zero. My point that. is, the people who are capable of delivering the necessary apology can be made safe because the whole point is it's the self accounting Mm -hmm. that allows you to deliver an apology that doesn't have any, you know, gray areas or, you know, places to hide uh, some kind of Mm self-deception. The full accounting that says, here's how I got it this wrong is itself a demonstration that the person has updated their model. Either that or they have to be diabolical and willing to say this and not believe it and not care which is very few people. I guess I think there's a third category. Uh, and I'm not sure. Um, I hope I'm wrong. Um, but as I heard it, you just described an apology that involves a description of the, way, uh, of the ways that a person was wrong uh, inherently is either accompanies an update in uh, the reliability of their decision-making in the future, or they're diabolical, and they are reporting something that uh, doesn't correspond to a change in the way that they're going to behave in the future. I think, unfortunately, that there are a whole lot of people who, in order to, like, oh, I just want this relationship back. Oh, can we just do, like, family thing, family holidays again? Okay, you know what? I thought about it. I saw you were wrong. I mean, I'm... <laughs> I fear that that's what people are actually thinking, but like, I thought about it, I see that we were lied to, and I made the wrong decision, and you know, here is why, but here's why I won't do it again. And yeah, I'm making like a caricature of it, I'm kind of rolling my eyes, but I feel like there's people who can deliver an apparently good apology who will be internally kind of like, oh, this is pro forma, but I gotta get through it because I really like this person. Oh, yeah. I really like my sister, I really like my cousin, I really like my friend from high school, I really like, I want, I need, it's my work buddy, it's my boss, I gotta just do it, and okay, are we good? I'm really sorry. Okay, good. Let's go have a beer. And I feel like there's a lot of those people. Yeah. And I'm worried about them because I feel like they're obviously from the past three years hiding in plain sight. Well, 
I am not arguing that somebody who delivers an apology necessarily deserves a, a clear, cleaning of the slate. Mm-hmm. My point is a proper apology that involves a self-accounting that did not do the following thing. The accounting you are afraid of, and I also agree, it, it, uh, uh, it is there to be feared, is the accounting that says, what is the minimum I have to acknowledge in order to get past this, yeah. right? The, per- the grudging apology, the minimal apology, that thing is strategic. And it is, it is functioning to preserve the capacity to do similar things in the future. I want no part of Even a, if that, none of that is conscious. Right. right. Whatever yes. mechanism it is that says, I really, I yes. want to get past this. And, you know, yeah. you can hear people who are actually good at apologizing, mm-hmm. you will hear. They are not monitoring whether this is enough for you to let them off the hook. What they are trying to do is tell you their own argument with themselves. Mm. Here, I'm angry at myself. Here's what for. Yeah. Here's what it looks like inside. And I'm just going to talk. I'm going to let you see that. And then you're going to decide if that's if, if that covers what you saw, right? And you mm-hmm. may say, actually, it doesn't. I hear what, you, what, what you're doing there. You have found this seven things that you did wrong, but you've missed these other two. Yeah. Like, think on it some more. And then right. come back to me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. And hopefully, we've all been there on both sides. Like, if we're, if we're adults past, you know, the age of, I don't even know what. But, you know, we presumably... All of us have done done wrong unto others and had wrongs done unto us that warranted complex apologies. And sometimes uh, the difficult conversation that happens does involve a, like exactly what you just said. Yeah, you've got some of it, but you don't have all of it, and that's not enough. And go back, go back, think more, come back to me after you have. And if they do, yeah, right, then what you have is somebody who is now hyper-conscious of this hazard that exists in them. That's the point, yeah. is that if you do this properly, then you end up conscious of things that most people are not fully conscious of. And so if you... But how often does this even happen? Like, you and I do this with each other. We do. Yep. And I think the audience... If you're watching, part of what you're watching for is because you can tell that we do. Yep. That we are actually honest with one another. And it's not that we're always perfect with one another at all. But we have we have both been on both sides of that. Yep. Okay? With each other. Have I been with other people? I don't know. I, so we are lucky to have in our lives each other with whom we can do that with and with whom we do. I don't know that most people have someone with whom they can do that, that it wouldn't just tear apart the fabric of the thing and it disappears into the wind. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this goes to a different conversation that we've had uh, multiple times here, mm-hmm. which is... Not so much here, this being the permanent, temporary, permanent, oh, temporary, no, permanent we, studio. We have never had this conversation here no. because this is the first conversation we've had here. But in the past on Dark Horse, we have mm-hmm. talked about the painful upgrade to one's uh, friend group that yeah. occurs in crisis because people disappoint you and they're actually telling you something that you need to know. They're not up to the challenge of being, you know, they can be a, a friend under simple conditions, but if a friend who cannot be a friend under difficult conditions isn't really a friend. Mm-hmm. And so you lose those people and you got to not do everything to get them back because if they're not capable of at least apologizing for what they actually did wrong, then it's not really a, it's it's not something to invest in. But yeah. the other thing is that people surprise you in the other direction, and you encounter these folks who you didn't know before, who are up to that challenge. And so I'm not telling you that the world is going to be full of people who are capable of delivering a high quality apology and deserve um, the forgiveness that comes from it. But I'm telling you that that's the thing you're on the lookout for. Yeah. And to the extent that you encounter people who do that, um, I think it makes total sense to put them in a very different category than you would put somebody who has not made eye contact with where they've been. Yeah, but yes, yes, I agree with you. No but, I guess. No, a but, which is that one of the things I saw this week, one of the reasons I started thinking about certainty was I see I see no holes, I see no tatters in the shield of certainty that the people 
who have accepted pronouncements from on high since the beginning of this thing have. If anything, they're more entrenched than ever. Well, and, and they're more self-satisfied than ever, and they're more eager to laugh at those of us who don't agree with them than ever. So, yeah, I want I want those people with I, with the with the real soul searching and the real apologies uh, to to start coming forward. But you know, it's it's like the entire world is now politics. No, I mean. Everything is politicized by some force, yeah. Um, but it it doesn't own everyone. And you know, you said something in your your setup here mm -hmm. about the tendency. If you were to look at the group of people who certain in one direction versus people who certain in the other direction, it was an evolutionary process in one direction and absolutely not in the other. Um, mm -hmm. And this, I think, is key, right? Yeah. The fact if you haven't spent time, if you haven't decamped from your position and seen the other side, then you don't really know how deeply you believe it. And in fact, who is it? Hume who formalizes this principle. Maybe. You know, he uh, who cannot articulate the other's position uh, knows little of his own or something like this. That sounds potentially hume -y. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's definitely humorous, but um, not, not really. that humorous. No. Um, but anyway, uh, the point... The point is, when you have an asymmetry like this, where one side gains people over time, right? You've got two sides that are claiming some something is in evidence. That's that's another prediction, then, right there, right? So, you know, I I, I said um, the level of certainty has changed on one side and not on the other, and and the second prediction here that you are making is one of the sides is um, gaining people and the other side, the prediction is, is going to be losing them. Yep. So, and we know they are exactly. because people have actually gotten vaccine injured, for instance. How many people do you know who um, started out thinking these uh, so-called vaccines were dangerous and now think they're safe? Right. That's, that's, that's that first, yeah, like yeah. it doesn't. It, it's not a known category for a reason, and it's because the evidence is. I mean, there, there were people like like the doctor I referred to who was like, ah, why, don't do this. Like, you had to wait a little bit. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm, not, I'm now going to take it. Okay. Well, but then that goes to the point that you and I were disagreeing mm -hmm. on, which is the difference between safety and harm. Yep. Right? That's right. And yep. so I would, you know, let me use a different analogy than I've used in the past. You know, uh, is it safe to get in your car drunk and drive home? <clears throat> no. Does that mean you're going to crash? Right. Nope. You could get home absolutely unscathed, right? So the right. point is harm and safety are two different things. We understand the difference very easily. Yeah. And no, and, I, and, and you're right that it's important. Like you, to, to say that you weren't harmed doesn't mean that it was safe. Like this, this, yep. And, and I, I feel like that's a formulation that I immediately grok and that I think almost everyone would too. Yep. You can say just because... Just because I wasn't harmed doesn't mean it was a safe thing to do. Whereas looking at it on the prospective side is harder to, to distinguish between the two. Right. Well, people, you know, this is the, the problem of the bluntness of language that comes from us all using a shared glossary that we, you know, some of us use things very precisely. We're very technical about it and we mean only what it is that we intend to imbue into those words and other mm -hmm. people just sort of hear it loosely. And so the idea of, you know, is is that pharmaceutical safe, right? Well, you know, if you talk to me, you're talking to somebody who spent an awful lot of time thinking about how pharmaceuticals might be unsafe on the basis that we have test animals that don't tell you what it is that test animals are supposed to tell you, right? So you're getting a technical uh, response rather than a, you know, safety, harm, what's the difference? Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I lost. There was some other thread I wanted to follow there, but um, well, we could uh, switch gears a little bit if you, if unless you want sure, no, to, sure, no, I to try to prompt you to think about what the thread was. I guess there was one more, one more piece, which has to do, and this is this is my own soul searching here. I think when I hear you talk about this, and I hear you talk about the anger at mm -hmm. people, I check with myself to see whether I'm angry. And then I find something funny that I can't quite 
figure out. I know it's real, but I don't know what it means. There's some way in which I know myself to be angry at certain people who did not do well by us in mm-hmm. the circumstance, but I don't feel the anger. Mm-hmm. It's like some part of me feels it, and then my conscious mind is shielded from it. And I have a feeling that that's serving a purpose, that there are things you can do if the emotion doesn't penetrate to the part of your mind that decides how to act. Yeah. And presumably there's also a huge cost to that. You know, anger didn't evolve for no reason at all. Anger evolved for a very good reason. And right. so there are places where you want to be able to keep it absolutely in check um, so that it cannot drive your behavior. And there are other places where it is important that it be seen. Mm-hmm. And I think probably um, whatever... For whatever reason, I am constructed in the odd way that I'm constructed. I'm paying one one cost in order to get to some benefit. And you know, I saw this in one other place that wasn't about anger. Um, there are two places in the Evergreen story where I run into the same observation about myself. One is that initial confrontation outside my class, the one that got captured and the one that put me in the public eye. Mm-hmm. I remember that interaction. I remember feeling my leg shake as if there was, I don't know, fear or a very strong emotion of some kind. But I remember thinking, that's odd that my leg is shaking because that's not how I feel. Hmm. Right? So I think some part of me felt it and some other part of me didn't. And the part that didn't was the part that was talking to the students, which was very effective. You know, people say to me about that scene, they say, I couldn't have done it, right? right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the point is, oh, that's because there's some circuitry that uh, blocks some emotion from rising to some level Mm -hmm. um, of feeling. And the other place is when I had tried to go to school on my bike and I had run into evidence that I was being ambushed in some sense, that there were students waiting for me in a place where I was known to go and I deviated and I went to the police station and I talked to Stacy Brown, the police chief, and she said, I don't think you're imagining it. Go home and get off your bike because we can't protect you. You report that when I came through the door that I appeared shaken like you've never seen me shaken. I don't remember being shaken. I remember thinking, I can't believe this is happening to me in 2017 in my own neighborhood in the United States. You know this thing, I was going to say that's written in literature, which no, you don't. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the way that people describe people who've been really scared or traumatized as having like an ashen face or a gray face. Yeah. And I, whenever I read that description, I think, I don't, what, what? But that's the thing, that, that's what I saw in you. That we, it, we, Like, just the color was gone. And it wasn't bloodless. It was, it was just, you looked like you were almost in black and white. Yeah, it's funny because I think I was having... Um, I was having a, an analytical response, which was, what does it mean to be hunted in your own neighborhood and have the police told they can't intervene? What has to be true in history? Where are you in history when that happens to you, right? Yeah. And so that was like um, a huge mental update. And it's one, you know, it's an update. I haven't gone back. I believe that that's where we are in history. Um, but the emotional part of it didn't even get recorded. Yeah. Right. I didn't. I don't think I felt it in some sense, and I don't remember it. Um, but you clearly do. You saw it. Yeah. I'm not sure that I would remember. I mean, you. You. I said it to you, and you've recalled it to me enough times now that it. You know, it. it I, you know, I now have a very clear memory of the memory, at least. So yeah. I don't. I don't know. I think that I would be remembering it with as much acuteness. Because it did, it did feel at the time like it was the it was the most X that I'd ever seen you, um, but it's it's always hard to know for sure. Yeah, you know how many how many layers of memory on memory are you making, and um, to what degree are you now buying your own story? Well, I guess uh, I'm, not, I'm talking about me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I got that. Um, I do wonder. You know, I, you and I have recognized that uh, I have some severe deficits with respect to uh, normal functioning in the modern world, keeping track of stuff, right? As time. Time, for example. Um, 
and that in emergency circumstances the opposite seems to be true mm -hmm. right i wonder if this thing isn't related to that i think it is yeah i think i think it almost has to be i think it is yeah all right you were going to switch gears oh boy okay <laughs> <laughs> okay switch gears into reverse then um this is just a little, I've got two other things, one of which is kind of related, one of which is not related at all. We're going to end by talking about cats and language mm. and people. Okay, a little piece of research that came out uh, that's kind of fun. Uh, and you might want to talk about something, uh, but one of the things that I was reminded of in Portland this week, which I am gratefully not reminded of here on our new island home in the San Juans, in far northwest Washington state um, is that so much of what is happening in cities is the celebration and promotion of mental illness and addiction. And you know, Schellenberger's book, San Francisco, mm -hmm. does an amazing job, actually, of describing the various, the various ways that people end up living on the streets. And ta he talks specifically about what a what a sleight of hand, what, uh, you know, a, a kind of a diabolical sleight of hand it is to just be like, well, they're homeless. That's what that category is. It's homeless. Uh, because that then allows people, many of whom are, you know, well-intentioned but wrong, to say, well, if your problem is homelessness, then what you need is a home, right? And so, you know, ah, then we have all these things springing up, all these organizations springing up. Like, what we need to do is, like, you, you can't do anything about any of this until you have a home for them. Like, that's the only solution. It's like, actually? There's a lot of categories of people who are living on the streets, and some of them are not down on, many of them are not down on their luck, had a series of bad events happen to them, and maybe a couple of bad decisions, but are really working hard to get themselves off the streets. That is not the description for most of the people I'm seeing on the streets in Portland at this point, right? Um, too much of it is at least partially facultative. Um, that is to say, by choice. And too much of it may have started that way, and then it's compounded by mental illness, by addiction. Um, and, you know, the way to deal with drug addicts passed out on the streets with their pants around their ankles is not to gently ask them if they like cleaner surroundings in which to get high. That's not it. Yep. That's, that's, that's not how you do it. Uh, and similarly, the way to deal with anxiety is not to encourage and promote it. And uh, I... I was thinking about going into a whole riff about Willamette Week. I don't know that we really want to do that. So Willamette Week is the um, Portland's free news weekly uh, the, of the sort of which exists in many, many big cities. L.A. Reader, Seattle. Uh, no, no, no. What Katie Herzog used to work oh, right for. Um, I can't think of what the Seattle one is called. Anyway, um, I'm sure there will be people in the chat who <laughs> figure it out or Zach's about to figure it out. Um, the, the free news weekly is a, is a thing and it's always been, you know, pretty left wing and it always, it used to have, um, you know, sex ads on the back pages. Um, but it always has like in the last third or half is like, what's happening in the city this week? Here's, you know, here's the live events. Here's the music. Here's, you know, here's, here's where to go. Here's the things that are happening. And, uh, I, when we first moved to Portland, I started donating to them on a monthly basis. I love a good free news weekly. And then they just took aim at us. They totally went after us, really despicable, and our book. And I don't know, I just, I stopped giving them money at that point. Yeah, I think uh, that was uh, at least <laughs> defensible. I mean, it wasn't a make it or break it for them, I hope, level of money, but for God's sake. Uh, did you figure it out, Seattle? Uh, the Stranger. The Stranger, stranger. that's right. Um, that's the, that's the Seattle version of Willamette Week in Portland. Anyway, I will say that as despicable as they became, I went looking, I, I picked up, I have here the most recent, I can't even find it now. Uh, yeah, this is the most recent Willamette Week from this week that I just picked up when I was in town. And, uh, and I looked at their endorsements also for the election. And I kind of said I'm a little shocked that they are doing a much better job of being careful uh, than they have been. And the, the easiest example to use here is uh, Portland, of course, has been managed completely god-awfully for, you know, through COVID and, you know, presumably before that then uh, as well. But that has been particularly revealing. And one of the things, one of the ways that it has been driven into the ground is by the city councilman 
person, woman, city council woman, Joanne Hardesty. It's completely awful. Like, really made so many bad decisions. Managed to get uh, the police defunded before finally it was not totally defunded, but largely defunded. And then uh, the funds were ultimately returned at the point that the homicide rate spiked. Like, you know, all, all of the stupid things that we're hearing about. Um, largely those policies were coming from her and then they were adopted by city council. She was a city councilwoman. And in May of this year, well, I we endorsed her in the city council race. And there were lots of people running. And in the primary, uh, two, uh, two people got the most votes such that they were in the election this last week, which was Joanne Hardesty and Renee Gonzalez, who we actually had the good fortune to meet at an event back, I don't even know, right, I guess before the primary sometime, so in May or something of this yep. year, April or May of this year. And he seemed great. And he indeed um, became her only contender in the election. And Willamette Week switched their endorsement. And they actually wrote an explanation of why and said, Hardesty is no longer the right person for Portland. Um, she has demonstrated that she is not doing what's right for, for Portland. And they endorsed Gonzalez. And Gonzalez actually won. Like, he, and, and good for Portland. Like, there's a whole lot not going on right for Portland right now. But congratulations, Renee. Like, that's that is awesome. a sign of hope. It is a sign of hope. Uh, and it was also a sign of hope when I saw that. And there was a, n a number of other things in Willamette Week. Uh, that I thought, huh, maybe they're getting a clue. That would be awesome. That would also help because that is, of course, uh, a publication that is read by the most entrenched, the, the people who are least likely to have models of what their opinions are as opposed to having received wisdom from on high, which in some cases might be Willamette Week. I look forward to their apology. <sighs> yeah, it's not going to happen to us, you mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that would be great. Um, a number of them are due, in fact. Mm. Yes. So all that said, which is my, like, oh, actually, cool, keep on doing that. However, uh, they're still publishing comics like this one, Zach, which I hope you have ready, uh, called Anxiety Garden. And I'll just read it for those who are listening and not watching. The, 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 the comic widely, more widely is called Anxiety Garden. So right there, you know something about it. It says... Hi, I'm Alicia, which is also the name of the person who creates Anxiety Garden. Hi, I'm Alicia. You know, the pandemic has been long and hard, but did you know it's not over? And the longer we pretend it is, the longer immunocompromised people like me are stuck in limbo. So keep masking and getting vaxxed, or else. I don't really know how to take that. So I went to this person's uh, website, and... This person's website describes them as Alicia Gatlin is a queer, disabled, non-binary comic artist making zines about rheumatoid arthritis, mental health, and niche interests. Why are we letting the uninvestigated and wrong conclusions of those who are celebrating their own anxiety drive people's sense of what makes sense at an individual and public health level. Why would we do that? Why would we let the anxious drive policy? The anxious are specifically anxious, which is getting in their way of making sound decisions for themselves and others. So I want to link this up yes. to where you started. Yes, I, it does link. I just didn't quite see the way to shoehorn it in, so go for it. So there's a short circuit there are certain categories that we are now told we are morally deficient if we don't feel a particular way about them, right? Yep. It's nonsense. This is not how feeling a particular way about things actually works. Mm -hmm. But we are told that you have to feel this way about people who entertain hypotheses of, of collusion, right? right? You have to feel this way about people who are hesitant about so-called vaccines, right? You have to feel this way about people who... Uh, you know, dress in women's clothing and want to go into women's bathrooms. There you go. This way about Ukraine. This right. way about January sixth. This way about Trump. This way about everything. And so it's the hijacking of a superficial model of the world. Right? How should you feel about people who suffer from anxiety? Well, I should feel compassionate towards them. Yes. Okay. Does that mean that I am required to like a cartoon? 
from their perspective that ends on a note that it threatens people who don't have this anxiety, in fact, attempts to induce anxiety into them? And the, and for people who come to a different conclusion, and frankly, the right conclusion, about whether or not everyone doing this thing that they want you to do is actually going to help them. Right. It's not. But to answer your question, why are we letting blank? Yes. If you are a Newsweekly, like Willamette Week, mm -hmm. and you have a piece of your layout to spare for such an exercise, then all of the people who feel obligated to have a particular reaction to it tell themselves, oh, that was a good cartoon, or I'm glad that was there, or whatever it is they tell themselves. And it is the exact equivalent of people... Remember how comedy became really, really unfunny and you could kind of tell it had become really, really unfunny because what people were doing was they were applauding the laugh lines rather than laughing at them, right? The point is that is... That's good. It's I, I haven't that. noticed that thing. That's well, right. Well, yeah. it, it's that same thing. So you imagine that this comic, which isn't funny, and by the way is... Threatening. Threatening, Yep. right? Um, causes people to do the equivalent of applaud something that they don't really believe in because the point is the applause is about I'm signing to that, you know, are you an anti-vaxxer? No, I'm signing on to these vaccines, that kind of thing, right? Um, so that reflexive view, and this is actually the same thing, it took me a long time to understand it, but it's the same thing as this business with the term homelessness. Yes. Right? The point is homelessness is a symptom, right? And it is no better, no more useful a description of the population that finds themselves, yes, without a home amongst many other things, right? It is a bit like, you know, you've got somebody and they've fallen off a boat and they're beginning to succumb to the waves and you diagnose them with pneumonia because they've got fluid in their lungs, right? It's like, no, they're drowning. Get them antibiotics. Right, exactly. <laughs> Throwing antibiotics off the back of the boat at this drowning person is not a useful remedy any more than giving these people homes is a useful remedy because it doesn't address the core problem, right? Yeah. Um, and so Sorry, anyway. I woke up the dog with my cry for antibiotics. <laughs> yeah. Right, no, you don't have to take any. No, um, you don't. But so, so one of the chats of the dog would wake up and what you made of that argument. Oh no! <laughs> That's awesome. He knows that was a good argument. That was that. No, was no, my argument. Give oh. him antibiotics. Oh, give him any. Yeah. Oh, there you go. All right. Oh, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 So anyway, I guess the idea is: how many years did I hear the term homelessness and not question it? Right. Right. I used to. Well, it did. It did. It was a different population in the seventies and eighties. It was. It was. I'm not sure. I mean, you know, we know that a lot of homelessness actually was the result of, you know, Reagan era policies that emptied, you know, asylums of people who didn't have the mental capacity to hold down a job. They were struggling with mental illness. Yep. And so the point is, their homelessness is no more homelessness than it is institutionlessness, mm -hmm. right? The point is, they were kicked out of institutions that had taken, I'm not arguing Having this, presumably being, uh, maybe not kicked out, but the people who ended up in institutions, not everyone, but many of them, their families were like, I'm at my wit's end, I can't do. I, like, I, I, this, this person has a condition which renders them uncontrollable by me in my home, even though I love them or I'm trying to love them, right. and therefore they need to go there. And then to have them released onto the streets, like, well, that's going to work. Great. So... This all, all that we have talked about today, raises a question that has just been bothering me for many, many years. And in fact, it started bothering me over respiratory illnesses long before there was COVID, which is there is no good guidance on what we collectively are supposed to do about a respiratory illness, right? If you think there is good guidance, oh, you're not supposed to go to work. Well, do the labor laws protect you for not going to work when you have it? Do we have some way of demonstrating that you have such a thing and so that we know that we are collectively better off if you don't go to work because you might spread it to 50 people while you're there? No. If you think there's good guidance, where's the threshold? Are you supposed to not go to work for a cold? Right. Arguably, we shouldn't go to work with a cold, but then you would How about have... if you don't have sick leave and you're working on an hourly, hourly wage? Right. 
you know, so the point is we, there is no guidance on, yes, we are not supposed to go to work when we have an infectious disease that we might communicate to others that we have contact with in the course of our work, Mm -hmm. right? There is no guidance. You are supposed to infer something that is incompatible between your responsibility to other people and your responsibility not to lose your job, Mm -hmm. your responsibility to your family to keep the roof over their heads. Potentially to your employer as well, Mm -hmm. with regard to, like, I'm on deadline, i got to get the thing done, whatever it is. Right. Right. And COVID actually began, it did a terrible job of it, but it began to have a discussion. How are, how is this disease spread? Finally, we're going to talk about that, are we? Right. What are you supposed to do if you have it? What are you supposed to do if you've contacted somebody who had it and you don't yet have any symptoms, mm-hmm. right? All of these things are, you know, there's some question. Then. Yes. Is it communicated by people who don't have symptoms? Now, I st- still don't think that that's as clear as people have come to imagine, right? Mm-hmm. We're supposed to believe that it transmits without symptoms. There's something a little suspicious about that idea because symptoms are, in fact, largely due to the mechanisms that pathogens use to transmit themselves. Point of order, a lot suspicious about that idea. A lot suspicious. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, were you to imagine in one of the many multiverses that there's one in which public health doesn't suck. No, Okay. Um, Imagine (laughs) sometime in the future, after our species has gone extinct and been replaced by another that is more... Go back to the multiverse then. (laughs) Imagine in some other version of the multiverse, public health does not suck. And what it does is it studies the way disease actually transmits. It puts forward that information. And then experts who are actually expert in something discuss what the best... Uh, policy is with respect to a cost-benefit analysis that is made explicit. In other words, we're not going to get an infectious disease to zero, right? We're Have not... you become a utopian then? No, I, I, I'm. A... Mm. No, darling, I'm not a, <laughs> a utopian. <laughs> the way to cause your brain to grind. I am. I am a no. believer in something which um, I, I don't want to use too many technical terms, but you might call it good governance. And no, I haven't seen it in a very long time, if ever, but... But the potential exists. The potential exists. And it needs to exist. Yeah. It does. And this, you know, and this is what the Game B movement is about. How could you, uh, how could you jumpstart good governance in a context where bad governance has so much power? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm back from the multiverse. I'm not a believer for those of you who are feverishly writing angry letters um, I, I don't believe, I do believe in a very small amount of free will. I don't believe in the multiverse. And uh, um, it's like a, it's a big reveal party here today. What else? And I don't believe we're living in a simulation, but I do believe there are two pieces of evidence that go in the other direction. Maybe we'll talk about that next week. Oh, I thought you were going to say you don't think we're living in a simulation, but we, you do think we're brains in jars. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of you, mm. that's, that's between you and your God. So our cats are on walkabout this week, and maybe since I have something specifically to talk about with regard to cats and some research, uh, maybe we should do that next week when our cats hopefully will not be on walkabout. Will not be on maybe walkabout. Maybe we should save the, the cats language and, and, and person discussion uh, so that for, they can wait for in. next week. There is a, there is, yeah, there's, a, there's an awesome end point that I'm just not going to give away. Yeah. All right. You feel confident of this because my, as you know, I don't even think the cats know their names. So I know their do. ability to uh, have any opinion whatsoever on the no, rest of what you have to say. We've been at it for a while. It's a totally different thing than anything we've been doing. And it would be nice to have cats in frame when talking about cats, don't you yes. think? We, we should talk in front of their backs, not behind them. Dish. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad we've agreed on something. That's, that's All right. a start. Um, I think, I mean, I don't even know when we started because we had so many technical difficulties, but I think we've been going on yeah. for a while. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Zach also can't tell us. I mean, yeah. The stream started an hour and 47 minutes ago, but that includes multiple timers and, delays yeah. and things. So. Well, I think it's, it's getting late here, and we're still going to do a Q&A. Yep. So we're going to stop this uh, for this week. We will be back same time. Same place next week, hopefully with better everything and more cats. And um, if you are with us live right now, you can stick with us. Give us a 15-minute break or so, or however long it takes. And we'll be back with a live Q&A. You can ask your questions at darkhorsesubmissions.com. Uh, any logistical questions, um, you can send to darkhorsemoderator at gmail.com. 
not questions that you want us to address on air. Um, that's, again, darkhorsesubmissions.com. Consider joining our Patreons, go into Natural Selections and read my Substack. We read a Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century if you like the kind of thinking that we're deploying here. And be good to the ones you love, eat good food, and get outside. Hang in there. We're bound to hit bottom at some point. <laughs>